Welcome to Music Ed Tech Talk, a podcast about music, education, and technology. I'm your host, Robbie Burns. Do you want an introduction or anything? That would be great. All right. Okay, so let's see. Who am I? I'm Elisa Jansen-Jones, and I help music educators build, manage, and grow thriving school music programs and have long and happy careers. But I also... Well, let's see. How do I do that? I'm a public speaker. I've written books on the topic. They're available on amazon.com. I've done many, many workshops. I've coached hundreds of music educators in developing their own instructional materials. I've hosted online conferences, events, like all of the national honor ensembles during the pandemic, that kind of stuff. I like to think of myself as a sort of lifestyle guru and entrepreneur. I'm a serial entrepreneur. And my day job right now is I'm the senior manager of artist relations and digital education for the Conselmer Corporation. And I'm a mom of three amazing kids. And yeah, I'm an athlete. I'm an athlete. I got 17 spam calls the other day. Yeah. That, yes. That's a lot. That's not, that's a little bit more than I have ever received, but it is Every time we find a way to get rid of the spam, the spammers figure out a way around that way. It's just kind of like the cycle of life. I get all yeah. these texts where it's like, hey, it's Jen. Are we still going out later? And I always wonder, like, what's what's the catch? Like, what are they going to get? Like, I don't understand SMS technology enough to understand that if I reply some snarky thing, if it's going to, like, put a virus on my computer or something. So I just usually delete and move on. You just never know. Like, are they collecting my personal info? Like, what are they going to do with it? And I'm not a super, you know, private person. I'm not, you know, I, I feel like I'm pretty easily found and pretty public, but I did just set a boundary for myself as I've taken on this role in artist relations that I don't want to give every artist on our list my cell phone number. So I did request like a corporate number, which will ring through Teams. Pretty tricky technology. Rings. So it rings the Microsoft Teams app, which you have on your phone, but you can like, I guess, control the notifications more thoroughly. Is that right? Absolutely. And then I know it's like from an artist because it's coming through teams and then they can they can do all the same stuff like i was i was going to set myself up with a google voice number which has been successful for me in the past which allows you to screen calls and and it it, it was one of the first ones like doing audio transcription of voicemails which even still is way better than what apple does on voicemail transcriptions by the way which are just comedic in in their assumptions so anyway so it's kind of like kind of like that. It's just like a phone, except that it doesn't have to be my number. It will look like they're calling Elkhart, Indiana. Yeah, that's really helpful. So like I, I use Slack a fair bit and I do like the, that like inside of the, you know, there's like my phone's notification settings, but like the Slack app itself lets me do stuff like this particular channel of conversation can ping me all hours of the day, but this one not after 3 p.m. That kind of stuff is, is really useful. I know Teams is sort of like a clone of it in some respects. So that's very cool. You have, it's like you have a day phone and a night phone. Yeah. Yeah. Can we go back to the Slack versus teams? Can we just agree that Slack is a far superior product than teams? I don't think we even need to talk. Of course it's, it's teams is my, my, my theory about current day Microsoft is that they're just gonna make a sort of lukewarm clone of every important productivity tool out there. And people are going to use it in mass because everybody's workplace has a Microsoft 365 account already. Yeah. And, and we've been going through this, you know, for the last two years at Conselmer, this massive, you know, business transformation, this whole, you know, enterprise solution, which I realize for your audience is probably not that big a stretch to understand, but literally everything from ordering parts for the factory and tracking all of our inventory outputs and the different stages, like is all done through this Microsoft ERP. And, and it's really, anyway, so we've gone like full Microsoft with absolutely everything. And it's been a really interesting transition to watch versus somebody like me who, you know, through my entrepreneurship attempts, I would say successful successes, entrepreneur successes, successes. in entrepreneurship. You're describing um, the repeat success of those efforts. Yeah, there, there we go. So, so I always, you know, did a tech stack based on 
the best technology and the way that it could integrate with each other instead of being like, nope, we're just doing Microsoft everything. Anyway, it's been it's been interesting to watch. People, especially teachers, are like this about the Google stuff because I know a lot of people use their things. And I'm very much of the mind that like if I can hobble together my own personal computing like network of apps that work for me, kind of like create my own OS, so to speak, then I'm going to be most productive. But there's like, but then you're building it. So like, there's things that I know that I would benefit from like Google features, if I was like fully committed to using the Google stuff, instead of just like using it for what it's good at. And then mostly, I use a lot of the iWork stuff. So, you know, Microsoft is the same, like, it's cool, they have a new, now they're working on a competitor to Notion. So like, they're picking up on all these, I don't know if you follow the personal knowledge management apps at all. But that's been a growing thing over the past few years and so now they're making like it's like an all-in-one canvas app that handles text images video snippets of excel tables powerpoint presentations notes you know it's sort of just like a collaborative workspace but a little bit more like information and media focused rather than like communication focused so i mean you could use it feasibly to like for for anything that you could use like one of the microsoft Sweet, sweet, sweet apps for, you know, I'm, just, I'm remembering a couple of years back, Microsoft said they're going to introduce start and I haven't seen it happen yet, but like, they're going to start making bits of their apps accessible inside of other apps. So like I could email you like an email with some tasks. And if I use the Microsoft to do app, I could like copy and paste a couple tasks, but then like, if you, you could like check them off within the email as you did them and then they would sync both, you know, like having the technology is sort of just like free floating little bits that all communicate rather than like these designated apps. Yeah. Interesting. Like w- within the, within the Microsoft, you know, and I realize this is not like the main topic that we're talking about today, but, but within like the Microsoft ecosystem, all the things do seem to talk nice to each other. Cause you know, in, in my role, I have to deal with almost, you know, a, a large handful of the apps that should be talking to each other. But what can we go back to like, how to choose the apps that work for you. Because I think so many people, and you've probably already covered this, like it can be so overwhelming with all the different app options. And I, I used to get asked the question all the time, especially early pandemic, you know, when, when teachers were just being like force fed or, or thrown all of these options for, for integrating into their classroom, it just becomes so overwhelming. And my personal theory is, is like, first of all, if, if, if you don't have a problem, why are you trying to find a solution for it? Yep. You know, and then number two, if if it takes you longer than like an hour to understand the basics of an app, then it's not intuitive and it's not for you. And like, try the next thing. Okay. Yeah. Preach. Because <laughs> that's the, and most of our, most of the technology that teachers are expected to are even in some cases like forced to use is not going to fit that description that you just did. But, but also like of the things that my district gives me really only a very small few of them are actually required to do my job. Like I have to use our like student management system for grades. I have to use canvas for like some communication and for like the grade actual like grade book accessible and transparent to students and families, you know, that kind of stuff. But there's not really much else they force me to use. Like we use Microsoft, 365 for email, but I can use the Apple mail app if I want to and access that. So, and, and the Apple mail app, you can understand the first time you look at it. Yeah. True story. If you have, if you have the ability, I do everything through my Apple mail app. I have three Gmail accounts and my work account that I'll go through there and save this bit because for later, but a different (laughs) unrelated thing, you know, the Microsoft 365, or I guess outlook, they call it like their email app does actually add some extra features. If you use it with a Microsoft account. So like if I'm using my work Microsoft account plugged into the Microsoft email app outlook, like there's some cool stuff. So like I've noticed that they have added these little social things, like a little thumbs up and a heart to messages. And there's some times where I open that app just cause I'm always dabbling in apps. And I realized that some thing I had sent my whole staff got like 10 heart, little heart, you know, reactions. And I'm like, Oh, that's nice. Yeah. I, I, we actually have like a, a GIF keyboard almost thing. So I, most often reply to like, instead of a one word email being like, thank you. I just drop a GIF. I think that's my love language. So like if I just send you random gifts, like 
we're we're cool. <laughs> yeah, that's a that's an important thing. Okay, now I'm gonna be sending you more gifts now that I know that about you. Yeah. So okay, so I'm working with the honor. There are okay. We have in Howard County six, well three the honor bands. Technically, I direct the one called the honor band, but there's like a GT Wind Ensemble, Symphonic Band, and Honor Band. And between those three ensembles, there are six directors. And I am going to be making the push at our first team meeting this Saturday that we should be communicating with something other than email. Now, Slack has recently changed their free tier to have a, it used to be like a 10,000 recent messages can be archived and searched, but now it's like 90 days of history. And that is kind of hard to think about being limited by with an ensemble where like it's super seasonal. So like, we're probably going to like really focus on planning the auditions that'll take place around October. And then we're probably not going to even think about that or talk about that again until the following October. And if we've only got a 90 day history of messages, that's going to probably not be great. So we do have teams, it's free. And this is the debate I'm going through is like, how do I, do I sell the team on the nicer, easier to use thing with some limits, or do we tow the company line and use the thing that's already installed on most people's work computers, but is it harder to learn? As a Teams user, do you how what do you think? Where where should I go in this direction? I mean, accessibility is everything. If it's not easily accessible, they're not going to use it. So having the something that is already installed and already accessible and does cool connection things, go to Teams. Yeah, that's the that is what I'm kind of thinking is going to be. Because you could argue that accessibility is also like how easy it is to use, which I believe Slack is. But um... mm, that, you know, we went through this a, a couple years ago, like I said, when we would like, we, we used to be on Slack and now we're on teams and there, there will be like some limitations, but like give it five days. They're going to, it's so much the same, especially if it's just like for communication, no problem. And it's great for like saving files that can be connected to your SharePoint or your OneDrive. It's all, it's all just going to be saved on the same you know, cloud server. So I don't know, that'd be my recommendation. Like it's the same password as their email. Just go with it. Yeah. That's the hard truth that I needed to hear this morning. What, what other hard truths can I help you with Robbie? I can put I my, I can put my coaching hat on. Well, here's the thing. Should we go backwards then? Because actually on the list of topics I sent you, you'd be surprised at how existential I can be on the topic of social media, Instagram threads and summer self-care, which <laughs> <laughs> Do you even know what I mean by putting summer self-care on this list? So, summer self-care, meaning that you use this time to recuperate your energy so that you can dive headfirst into a fresh school year? I mean, I know you believe in that. So I figured that as someone who is a little bit struggling with the idea of returning to school already, that maybe you could like, you know, talk me off a ledge. And then I can assume that lots of other teachers who are listening to this are feeling that same feeling and are benefiting from your wisdom and passion. Oh, okay. Let's, let's hit this because it it is, I like to think of myself as someone who, who has enough life experience in enough different realms that I maybe have something to offer in this particular area, especially since I wrote a best-selling book on it anyway. So here's my theory on self-care is that it's not a summer thing. It's not a one-time thing. It is a daily and constant thing. So for the idea of going back into a school year where you understand the anxiety and stress that you're going to be under, you can mentally and emotionally prepare for that by establishing a daily self-care, let's call it a practice and mindset as you go into the year. The thing that used to always help me when going back into school, and please understand like my first couple years of teaching elementary music, I was building a business at the same time. And I felt my day job was a burden an obligation and something that I was not trained for and did not want to do. Don't tell anybody I said that though. Okay. <laughs> so the point is it was an obligation that got me like out of my first marriage, which I needed to do. And it was like just my paycheck while I was building my business. Okay. So I was a little salty about it and did not want to go back. But the thing that I, the, like the, the mantra that almost helped me was that I still have my personal time, right? Like, yeah, I'm going to go to school, but I'm not going to be there forever. It's going to end. The bell's going to ring and I'm still going to come home. Like going to school doesn't negate the fact 
that I can still be coming home every day. And it doesn't negate the fact that I can be taking care of myself and progressing in all the ways that I want to be progressing. And by thinking of it as a burden and something that's anxiety inducing and something that like you're, you're setting yourself up for that. Like my dad, who was my, my mentor and, and, you know, my college band director and everything, he used to say what you most want to be, you are and argue for your limitations. And sure enough, they are yours. And what he was trying to say through that is through those, you know, quips that he would literally throw at me when I'd miss a note on the French horn and be like, argue for your limitations. Like, well, my lip is sore. Argue for Anyway, I digress. So the point is the entirety of life is based on your own perspective. And the beautiful thing about that is that your thoughts are entirely controlled by yourself. So if you're thinking, oh my gosh, I'm so anxious about school starting. Oh my gosh, it's just going to suck the life out of me. You are right. You are 100% right. Now, if you switch it to being like, I'm so excited for this school year. I'm looking forward to meeting my new students. We're going to learn some really cool stuff. I get to hone my skills. Every step that I take is leading me to the next best version of myself. Even the stuff that I don't maybe want to do right now, but every single thing is making me a better, stronger, more improved version of myself. Now you're changing the energy around that. You're changing your your entire mindset and you're changing your entire frame of reference for it. So if you want it to suck and you want to be anxious about it, then you're welcome to do so. I found that reframing things seems to really help you have a better experience overall. One of the things that I miss now that I've moved into corporate and out of teaching is like, I miss having the freedom of a summer vacation. But to be honest, I have like the most awesome job with the most flexibility. And so I still get as I can, like your vacation, your self-care shouldn't end when the school year starts. It should be something that is part of you because you love and care for yourself on a daily basis. I'm trying to put myself in this frame of that like reflection, not on like, what is the summer supposed to mean? Cause I'm not getting anywhere thinking about like, if the summer itself is supposed to like mean something for me as like a refreshed or renewed individual or someone who is passionate or oriented in a positive way towards their job. It's really more about thinking about like, okay, like what are the things that this fall I need to do every day that are those like moments of self-care that make, you know what I mean? So I'm, I'm rereading um, the James Clear book, Atomic Habits. And, you know, I'm like looking at, into it and thinking like, okay, there's like some obvious little things that could go a really long way next year. Like riding my bike for 20 minutes every day. That's possible. Oh my gosh. If you, if you want just one, like, like Mario Kart bullet, do you know what I'm referring to? When you're last place in Mario Kart and then you get the the little question cube yeah. that gives you the bullet and it like sends you to the front of the bullet. <laughs> if you want, if you want the one, the one magic bullet, that's going to improve like every aspect of your life. It's daily exercise. Keep, let me have it. Cause this is what I need. <laughs> no, I mean, it truly is. <laughs> so, so when I graduated with my MBA and I decided like, okay, I'm going to go ahead and start my own business. I mean, I have an MBA. I should be able to do so. And I had started my own business before that, but you know, this time around, I really wanted to embrace the entrepreneurship lifestyle with the understanding that when I went back into teaching, we are entrepreneurs. We are problem solvers who are creating a product or a service that is serving the needs of a specific population. That is what entrepreneurship is. And as I see it, that's what we do as music teachers. We are, we are solving problems by offering these solutions to our students. They don't have music in their lives. We want to create them a, a love of music that will serve them their lifelong. True? True. Okay. So if we take the entrepreneurial mindset, there are certain things that these entrepreneurs do on a daily basis. And if you read about any really successful entrepreneur, they will tell you daily exercise and they usually start their day with it. And that's because it it's less about like, I mean, there's all the physical benefits for sure, right? We know about that. We're taught about that, but we don't talk enough about the mental benefits and the emotional benefits. All you need to do is like ride your bike or go for a run. I used to commute to school on my bike. I would load up like my teaching clothes in my backpack and like my lunch and everything I needed for the day, ride the 10 miles into my school, 
leave my bike in my classroom because my students just love to pick it up because it's super light and sexy. <laughs> anyway, and then, you know, I'd change in the teacher's bathroom and go about my teaching day. And those were the days that I was the most chill, that I was the most effective, that I felt the healthiest. We tend to think like, oh, exercise is going to drain me. Oh, I'm too tired to exercise. And it's exactly the opposite. When you exercise, you're energized. Like if yeah. you want to, if you want to be more emotionally stable, a higher cognitive function and literally just feel more joyful throughout your day and feel like you can handle anything, just like 20 to 30 minutes of exercise in the morning. Even if it's like vigorous, you will have more energy throughout the day by expending that energy in the morning. Yeah. And I, it's that morning part that we'll come back to in a second, but I'm, I'm kind of done like thinking of my mind and my body as like even different, like they're, they're of one substance, you know, it's all just like mush, like swirling around up there. And we are just, like, we are just big sacks of meat that are this miraculous thing on this earth. Like, do you ever wonder just like, we could get super existential here. Like, what are we doing here? I'm asking those questions. I ask those questions every summer. It's part of the reflection, which by the way, I think I'm also putting a positive framing on some of the anxieties that some people might identify with, like going into the year, like just thinking about like, can I like bring what I know I can bring and influence my students in the way that I know I can influence them? You know, like these kinds of things. There are tools for me now to reflect. I mean, <laughs> the truth of the matter is that we hold ourselves to far higher standards than we ever need to. And so if we were just to relax into it and be like, you know what, I'm a great teacher and I trust myself and I'm going to be able to respond to literally anything that happens to me because I am adaptive and that's just who I am. I can't go wrong. I can't make a mistake because there's no such thing as a mistake. You either are successful or you learn. So there's no mistakes. It's only lessons. So that, that negates the fear of failure, right? By seeing it as like, it's not a failure. It's just a lesson. It's helping me literally improve and become better. And then just acknowledging that you can, you can trust yourself. You know what you're doing and just accept it. You can't go wrong. Yeah. So you think the exercise has to be, because, because what you're describing is it's like, we have that ideal for ourselves. You know, this is like that kind of more focused and centered, balanced way of navigating my profession, but it really does help to slip into that mindset if you are also like, well, to start off. And that's, <laughs> that's where like the exercise and the release of the things into my body by doing so. That's why I really am starting to think it's got to be a morning activity. And it is the hardest time of day for me to like do it because I really like to sleep till the last possible second where I know I'll be to, you know, to work. So, I mean, I, I'm a morning person, but even I struggle to get up sometimes. For example, yesterday I did two long bike rides. I have this thing where my kid isn't ready to get his driver's license quite yet. And he started marching band and we live like 15 miles from his school. Okay. So to save on gas and to let him drive, we drive out there together. I leave the car. I hop on my bike. I ride the 12 to 15 miles home, depending on the route. Okay. I get home, I work all day, and then I ride back out there to pick him up. Savvy? Sounds great. Okay. Except that it's 101 degrees yesterday at four in the afternoon when I got on my bike to leave and I'd eaten maybe 300 calories that day. This was just yesterday. Okay. So I finally get back to my car. I go to pick him up. I'm dizzy. I had not taken care of myself which is so rare for me, you guys. So super rare. I spent the evening recovering. Okay. I was okay. But I woke up this morning and on my schedule, I had to go for a run Wednesday morning. I woke up, I listened to my body, not ready for a run. I laid in bed a full extra hour, but that did not prevent me from doing my morning ritual. The things that I feel like I have to do to get into a good mindset and set myself up for success the rest of the day. And so the things that really help me is number one, like prepping for your exercise the night before, because if I'm like, oh, I'm going to go for a swim in the morning and then it's 5 a.m. and I'm trying to find my like goggles, then chances are good. I'm just going to go right back to bed. Right. Yep. 
And then, so, so set yourself up for success by prepping the night before, and that's not going to, that's going to prevent you from having any kind of excuses. And then the other thing is, is like, just commit to doing it. Don't commit to duration. Just be like, okay, I'm going to go for a run. Even if it's two minutes, even if it's five minutes, like I'm just going to go for a run because mentally it's the starting is the hard part. Cause once you get into it, then you can, you go for as long as you, you can go because it, it just feels so good. It's the same thing with getting students to practice. You know, I have three children who are all musicians and thankfully the oldest one never had to be told to practice a day in her life, but the second one does, you know, he'll be like, Oh, I should go practice piano or whatever. And I'll be like, why don't you just do it for like two minutes? Like that is such a low barrier to entry that no one can say no to it. So Give yourself that same kind of grace and be like, you know what? I'm just going to try it for like two minutes and chances are good. You're going to do more than two minutes. You're going to do like five. You're going to do 10. And then when you're done, you're going to feel so good that you're like, hmm, really glad I did that. And then the next day that becomes your motivational fuel is how good you felt doing it before. Is that helpful? It's so helpful. Yeah. So, I mean, definitely like the idea of making it easy for yourself and then just like, yes, yeah, committing to the just doing it. Are, and those are those are in the James Clear book. I don't know if you read, did you read that book? I listened to the audio book. Me too. And I liked it a lot. And, I, and I'm and i thinking to myself like, okay, there are, some, there are some addressable things here. Like if the alarm, I'm also thinking that next school year, I'm gonna like do that thing where you like, don't look at your phone for the first hour of the day. Mm-hmm. So wish, wish me the best there. So I think what I'm gonna do is like leave <laughs> leave it down and like have just have a charging station on the main floor of the house for all my junk. And then I'm gonna, I'll have my watch. I track my sleep with it, but then I'm just gonna like, we have this like smart speaker across the room from the bed. I think I'm gonna just use that as the alarm and then I'll have to get up to turn it off or else my wife will be super upset. That's the motivation. And then my shoes, my bike shoes will be there. I'll also, I'm gonna wear, I don't usually wear socks to bed. I'm gonna wear socks to bed so that there's no fumbling for socks in the dark. And then there you go. That's, those are the things I think. Put it's your socks in your bike shoes. Put them in my bike shoes. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's not a bad idea. No, I'm here. I mean, week. Okay. So I, I actually talk about like not looking at your phone, but I think it's less about the looking at your phone and more about like controlling your impulses to immediately open things that are going to initiate your day with stress. Cause I use my phone for my insight timer app which I use for yoga, meditation, and breathing. I use the Wim Hof breathing app. I use my human design. I use my streaks app to track everything. So yeah, for me, it's like, I, I can't not look at my phone. That's how I am tracking my progress. It's how I'm creating these metrics for myself, but I do keep it in like airplane mode, you ooh, know, ooh. cause the, the last thing I want to do is, is start my day with other people's problems. Like that's, that's what it is, is we forget that we're not being the sovereign of our own life when we're being beholden to other people's needs. And unless you're sending yourself like a hundred emails a day being like, Oh my gosh, Robbie, you're so amazing. I love you so much. Like it's going to be everybody else's demands on you. And so by limiting their ability, literally like push themselves on you by keeping your notifications off, you're, you're owning your own sovereignty. And there's something incredibly powerful in that. And then about keeping your phone downstairs, I found that when I'm getting on a new sleep schedule, that having my phone in the downstairs or, you know, where I have to actually get up and turn it off before it blazes and kill, you know, wakes up my whole family absolutely the biggest motivation. Yeah. I think that's part of it too, is just the need to, to, you know, really like actually do something in order to address the alarm. So I actually do like to use a lot of, I use quite a few tracking apps, but I, and actually I went ooh, ooh there because I would like to, I feel like I can slightly improve your technological workflow. If you're using airplane mode, can I, can, have I told you the good news about focus modes? I mean, hit it. The, Wait. the show's most reoccurring theme, probably. <laughs> the oh, year. no, no, no. Like focus modes. Let's see. What what are my focus modes? Let's see. I'm on personal right now. Me? Oh, I'm I on have, Music Ed Tech Talk right now, but I was previously on personal. I have work. I have sleep. I have fitness. I have studying and I have driving and then just general do not disturb. And then, yeah, I have it set up. So like if I'm in sleep mode, my children can always text or call me. I'm always going to get their stuff. But if I'm studying, literally nobody can 
can reach me. So I think what I need to do, because I have a sleep one, you know, configured for exactly what I want to come through and not come through when I'm asleep. But I, I have a shortcut that I programmed, which triggers into sleep mode, like when I hit a button on my phone that I only press when I'm pretty much like in bed, like this is the last thing I'm going to touch on my phone before bed. And it like turns all the lights in the house off and like opens my meditation app and stuff. So, so I'm thinking to myself, like, because that sleep mode like immediately snaps out of sleep mode the second that i like unsnooze or uh, you know hit the okay button on my watch alarm i'm pretty much like only actually sleeping in sleep mode but I, what i really need is like maybe it's something like your fitness one where it's on first thing in the morning because my personal fo- i'm always in a focus mode personal focus mode pr- lets a lot quite a lot of things through like text messages and things from lots of different ranges of people so I'm thinking maybe I need like a fitness one where it's like, okay, I'm not sleeping, but I'm also like not accepting messages at this time. Maybe that's the the solution. And then it would, of course, yeah. no, no apps. Because, you know, a focus mode, I don't know if you know this, it doesn't just control like which apps, notifications and people can get through. You can actually set a custom home screen and lock screen on a per focus mode basis. So you could say like when you're in fitness mode and I go to the home screen, you only show me the, like these four fitness apps and then like none of the notifications come through, none of the badges show any unread anything, like just these four apps. Oh my gosh, that's so hot. It's great. You can actually make a watch <laughs> face and a lock screen conform to a mode as well. So like I've got my kid on my personal, but when I record this show, I have like the, you know, the album artwork on my phone. Aww. And then Aww. Like, a calendar and then so you know okay but i have like my ideal home screen thing happening right now so i'm not gonna change it it's pretty amazing yeah i mean you gotta i, I my first page of apps is pretty consistent across numerous fo- focus modes yeah i still remember when i showed you my phone and you were like let's see what apps you have <laughs> like oh, yeah. as few as possible <laughs> like if i don't use it in three weeks it's gone what what is the point of it being in my life but i'm pretty minimalist and in all things like that, except for my books. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm like definitely not that case. Oh, again, coming back to tools, <clears throat> my way of using like personal tools that work for me has been to like use lots of things that are very, very, very good at a very specifically small bit of the puzzle, and then like creating the network that strings them all together myself. So I'm I'm gonna have apps installed on my phone, and I do like asking people this question because it's a lot better than what I do alternatively, which is just stare at their computer screens without their consent and look at what's on the dock. <laughs> it's a, like one of my favorite people watching things is to see, just see what I can learn about a person by looking at the apps on the dock of their Mac. Interesting. <laughs> what's, what's on the dock of your Mac? Oh, well, that's that's very personal. No, I'm just kidding. Well, <laughs> to I be guess? fair, my my Mac my com- that I'm using right now is my work computer. And it was being used by my video editor for the better part of the last two years. So it's mostly his apps that are up. I use, let's see what's in the doc right now that I use. I use Snagit every day. I can't live without it now. I don't even know what that is. This is not expected. (laughs) Like the messages app would be like your first one or something obvious. Work computer. I don't have have Apple messages on my work computer. Also because I didn't want my video editor to have access to my messages. So we're we're still describing that same computer, not your other. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. My, my, I mean, we can talk about my other two computers, but yeah, the one I'm, I'm on right now, of course I have finder. I have notes. I have my my corporate, you know, things, Microsoft Remote Desktop, Sonic Mobile Connect. I have OBS. I have Premiere Pro on there, although I don't use it. Again, that's my editor. And then the app I'm using to record our audio. So it's pretty uneventful. Are you disappointed? No, I, that was for a work computer. That was that was pretty, that was pretty good. You, you know, you I got mean, OBS, so you're a power user. Yeah, but normally it would be Teams. Outlook, Snagit, Chrome. Yeah. That's pretty much it. So you're a, you're a really minimalist doc person. That's I, 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 I don't I, like I, feeling overwhelmed. I mean, but ask me how many Chrome tabs I have open right now. <laughs> well, okay. Here's the thing. This is why I love being app ba- app focused instead of like web focused. Because to me, the management of the windows on that are open on my de- computer's desktop is easier to work with than a bunch of tabs. Because the tabs, it's like only the one that's in the foreground. Also, I work very differently on the Mac. I don't do this on any of my other devices, but like windows that are open, whether tabs in the browser or like just a window and a document type app, they're like, sometimes they function like 
unaddressed problems, tasks, or like decisions I have not yet made. Accurate. So like having the tabs all be sort of like just, you know, equal to each other, but only one of them like showing itself to me, that doesn't make me feel as productive as, again, this is again, the, the, the you know, using of many, many small little things. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. Do you do a lot of pr like productivity software in Chrome? Do you have a lot of web apps you use for work? Mainly the one I use is monday.com, but that's because it's been, it's a, it's a project management tool and we use it internally for collaboration. So because that's the tool that I've been given, that's the tool that I've adapted for most of my purposes. Got it. Cool. So I have a running to-do list in there, but I can view it based on, like I can have a Kanban view. I can have a Gantt chart view. I can reassign my tasks. I can prioritize my tasks. I can filter my tasks. Yeah. So that's pretty much it. Yeah. yeah. I, I mean, like I, like I said before, if it's, if it's not solving a problem for me, then why am I doing it? Yeah. I mean, it's a great, it's a great place to start. There's so much technology out there that like is just in search of a problem instead of actually like resolving one. But I can tell you the apps on my phone that I use every day. Yeah. Let's do that. Also very pretty minimalist. Most of them have to do with my morning ritual, which I've referenced a couple times now. So I have my human design insight timer, Wim Hof. I use my notes app for most of my like vision board affirmations, a list of my superpowers, which Have is fun. Have you ever fun. tried a journal app? I keep my journal in Google Docs. Okay. So you, you think of that as like a separate process. It's still something that I do and I track it on my streaks app. I can tell you that I am on a 117 day streak of journal writing. And I just started to integrate instead of one journal a day doing two. So I do one in the morning to clear my thoughts after my like meditation and stuff like that. And then I do one at the end of the day to sort of chronicle life. I think I've realized like what a morning person is just now in my life, because <laughs> what you just described, like when I wake up, I have no thoughts, <laughs> none. Like a journaling would, would not, I don't even know what I would write, but at the end of the day, it's like the most chaos you can imagine happening in your mind is like mine. Like the most unimportant things are equal in importance to like things that like we won't survive the day if I don't do or address. <laughs> well, I mean, can we, can we talk about, I mean, I have a really strong morning routine. I want to um, know exactly what you do if you'll share it. Your okay, absolutely. So the first thing I do is throw my feet off the bed and I drink most of a liter of water. And I take my morning supplements. You do the that ones in your bedroom? Like, oh, yeah. I keep a Nalgene bottle of water next to my bed. Because again, I'm looking to sharpen the details of this process. So like I, I, that's one of my first things, but I do it like I have a little powdery thing I pour into a 16 ounce glass of water. And that's, but that's like, do you think it's easier to do it in bed? Is that why you do Is it? Is that like an adaptogen that you're? It's like a, oh, it's like a salty, one of those like salty sweet packets. You know what I mean? I'm not okay, like a it power pack or something like an electrolyte. Correct. Okay. Yes, that's the one. <laughs> a hydrating solution. Okay. Re remember, I'm also an athlete, so I'm going to know that stuff. All right. So, all right. So I hydrate first, take my pre, like the supplements that you want to take without food. I take omeprazole because I have a weird stomach thing. Anyway. Wow, this is like getting so personal. And then I go downstairs and I make coffee for my husband and tea for myself. I used to drink coffee. I've been off it about 10 days now and I'm working through some loose leaf, like really excellent teas. And then I Hold come on. back up. We could go down that. We could go there, but I want to know, have you not brushed your teeth yet? This is important to me. Oh, I've taken out my retainers. Okay. Okay. Got it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I can okay. tell you why I asked you that, but it's not that important. <laughs> Okay. I know that a lot of people have that as a habit, like that wakes you up. I find that the, the drinking water is what wakes me up. Okay. So that, and then, and then here's my mantra, right? Is when I wake up and I'm like, Oh, I'm so tired. I'm so tired. I just want to go back to sleep. Then I remember that get up to wake up, right? Like it's the actual movement of getting up. That's going to wake you up. It's not laying in bed that wakes you up. Laying in bed is triggering to your body that it wants to sleep. And now is the time to sleep. So if you're like, oh, I really struggle with getting up or waking up, 
then just get up and move your body. That's why having your alarm away from your bed can be such an effective tool if you're adapting or you want to be, because it's going to force you to get moving. And that just signals to your body, okay, it's time to wake up. And that is what wakes you up. You're never going to wake up while laying in bed, period. So I go downstairs, I make hot drinks. I love my hot drinks. Come back upstairs, leave the coffee cup by my husband who's going to sleep for another 90 minutes. And then when the weather's nice, I have a little setup on, we have like a balcony off the master bedroom. Then I will just go out there. So all summer long, that's my spot. And then when it turns into colder weather, I come downstairs where it's like a family room with my huge desk, all of my antique books. I have a fireplace and then I have a sun lamp. So I'll come down, turn my sun lamp on, lay out my yoga mat, drink some hot drink. That's the other thing that starts to help wake me up. And then I go immediately into yoga. I open my insight timer app. I start my yoga and I will do between four and 40 minutes of yoga. Just following what my body needs feels really good. Wakes me up. Next, I do my Wim Hof breathing. Depending on how much time I have, I'll do between one and five rounds of Wim Hof breathing. I'm not going to go into it. You're going to have to look it up. (laughs) Like today, remember how I said that like I had a really hard day yesterday. And so I was like in recovery mode until this afternoon when I go for my run, because I'm not going to miss my run today. I just moved it to a different time when it's better for my body. Okay. So like this morning I was running out of time because I had to take my kid to band, but I wasn't going to skip my Wim Hof. So I just did one round. Whereas on Sunday I did five rounds because I had more time, but it goes back to the, it's about consistency rather than duration. So I do my Wim Hof and then I usually will listen to something from my human design. Again, we could go into it, but I'm going to let you just look it up. It's super cool. It's like a it's like a self-identification app or self-knowledge, self-discovery. That's the best way. Okay. Self, self-discovery. And then I will set my 10-minute meditation timer, again, between 10 and 20 minutes or five if I'm feeling frisky or in a hurry. And then I will read through my affirmations, do my visualization, remind myself of my superpowers, and remind myself of why I'm committed to my goals. Okay. All of that's very important to kind of get my brain right. And sometimes now I'm a very active dreamer. I have lots of dreams. Often they are extremely realistic, like to the point where sometimes I'll wake up and it will feel like a memory and I'll have a hard time like figuring out which is dream and which is memory. And then sometimes I actually have prophetic dreams. So that's the other reason I like to journal is that it allows me to like brain vomit those things out. It's like at the end of the day, why I'd like to journal at the end of the day is because it, it just gets all those thoughts out so that your subconscious mind isn't dwelling on them all night long. And in the morning, it's like, I'm, you know, extracting those thoughts in the morning so that I'm not dwelling on the dream state all night, all day long. Does that make sense? Yeah. If I dreamed like that, I, yes, I get it. I actually have categorized my dreams, excuse me, into like four different types or categories. It's, it's crazy. Anyway. So I do those things and then I will sit in silent meditation for as long as I need to. And my entire goal in that is not just to like clear my thoughts. Although that's very helpful. If you can get to that point, as you can tell, I have an extremely active brain. Instead, I just focus on joy and I just get to the feeling like where I feel really happy. And i I go, okay, where in my body am I feeling this? And how long can I hold on to that feeling? And whenever my thoughts start to encroach or I start to lose that feeling of joy, I go right back to it. I'm like, oh, I got off on, you know, something that has to do with work or whatever. And now I'm going to just come right back to that feeling of joy. And if we have a hard time getting to that feeling, gratitude is the surefire way to get there is just to start to think about things that you're grateful for. Think about the people that you love, but it's that feeling of like joyful love in your heart. And I think of this as we are literally practicing being joyful. We're practicing being happy. So just like a musician, if we're practicing our instrument, then we could, we should be able to pick up that instrument and play it at any time. 
well, if we're practicing being joyful, happy people and tapping into that feeling, then even when we're super stressed at work, when our students are being poorly behaved, maybe there's, you know, some sort of injury or challenge or who knows what happens in your classroom, you can still pick that feeling up and tap into it at any moment. Are you saying like, ident- see if you can identify where in your physical body you feel something associated with that? I mean, that that helps for people who are very like tactile and and very physically oriented because you literally can like right now, think about somebody that you love. So now imagine if if you can trigger that feeling with that thing or that person or whatever, then if you had a constant reminder of that or something to remind you of that, that you can turn to in times of challenge or when you feel like you've sort of lost that space or you need it, then would that still work for you? Like a picture of that loved one or a locket with them in it or a ring that they've given you or whatever. Yeah. Or could you even like the picture the feeling itself? I, I wonder this because so much of the meditation that I've done that has been successful is ultimately just like really focused on physical breathing. And I don't know, it's like, I, I feel like to some extent I can will to regulate my mind and my body in a way that like, just by focusing on breath, I can gain some control. Cause we, you know, the body is at times pretty involuntary. So it's interesting. Yes. Like I'm feeling or thinking this, actually there is a strategy or two or five that can like shape that. I mean, like if you're a noob at this kind of thing, I mean, obviously this has been a practice for me. I say obviously, but I, you know, unless you know me, I, I, this has been a practice of mine for 12, 15 years. Okay. So I'm pretty far along this road, but even I struggle in times to be able to tap into those feelings or whatever. And it still comes back to experimenting, finding what works best for you. Now, the reason why breath works for so many of us, especially if we're instrumentalists, like it taps us into something that we've learned from a very young age, if you think about it, but also we can control our breath, just like we can control our thoughts, right? But our body is going to respond or our mind is going to respond to that physical trigger. So the reason why breath is so great is because if, if we're breathing high and fast, then that is signaling to our body that we are in a heightened state of anxiety because we're about to run away from something we're afraid of, right? It's, it's like a, sort of core medulla oblongata thing, right? But if we can slow our breathing down, then that triggers to our mind, like we're safe. Like I've made it into the house. I've run away from the bear. I'm now in a safe place. I can now breathe slowly, but nothing says that we can't be in a high anxiety situation. I like to think of a, you know, elementary school concert performance with 450 kids in different states of excitement. Like to me, that was a pretty high anxiety situation, but if we can control our breathing, then that literally signals to our brain, like I'm safe. I'm okay. It's okay for me to be happy. That's why breathing works so well. It's your mind responding to the physical triggers of your body. Totally. So I don't think that we're not even through your morning ritual yet, are we? I mean, we're, we're pretty close, right? So I, I do my meditation and, and I keep my journal open so that if there are thoughts or like, oh, I need to remember to do that today or whatever, I can quickly write those down and get right back into my state of joyful practice. And then I, I finish up by writing in my journal and then I go usually and go do some exercise at that point because then I can come back, shower, makeup, all that get ready for the day. It's good. It's long. You just described kind of like a perfect morning though for me, but in order to achieve it, you needed like a number of hours before any of your work (laughs) begins. That would make me anyway, have to go to bed at like 7 PM. Okay. Okay. Remember how I said that it's less about duration and more about consistency. No, I I hear you. It's like, Robbie, could you do 30 seconds of meditation? Sure. Could you, could you spend five seconds reading an affirmation? Sure. Okay. What if you spent another 30 seconds just visualizing the next version of you and what does that look like? Yeah. Okay. So there's, so starting the starting, you started by starting is what you're saying. Yes. So the key here, and, and I, I, it's not like I woke up one day and was like, I'm going to build myself my perfect morning routine and I'm going to blah, 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 blah. Like I read a book years ago called the miracle morning. 
And that author suggests like six things that we know we should be doing every day to move our needle forward. Again, it's it's written for entrepreneurs, okay? And his are writing, silence, affirmations, visualization, meditation, exercise. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Missing coffee, but otherwise good. Right. So, so that kind of got me thinking about it, but it has literally taken me like seven years to figure out the things that are working best for me. And it doesn't mean that I can't, you know, like if at one point I'm like, okay, I feel pretty good about my human design. I'm not going to need to do that anymore. Or I'm not finding as much benefits in Wim Hof. I'm going to integrate something else. Like I have, I can do that. It's, it's not like I'm committed to these because I have an app for them, you know, I'm committed to them because they specifically are, are helping me become the person that I want to be. And I need to do this for myself in the morning because number one, I think that I deserve it as do all of you deserve to take care of yourselves in the very best way possible. Cause that's the only way that we can continue to give to others, but I need to do it so that I'm the best version of myself to give to my friends, family, colleagues every day. And on the days when I don't do it first thing, like, let's say I have a, a really early morning meeting because it's with a colleague in Asia or in, in Europe, which happens like meeting with Henry Selmer Paris people always starts at like 6 37 AM for me. Cause that's like, for 4 30 for them in Paris. Right. So sometimes I might skip it and then come back to it later in the day, but I will feel the effects of that. Yeah. So I think it just comes down to like, where do you want to be? What are the things that are going to help you in the morning? And my guidance is like, if there's just one thing, just one thing it's exercise. Yeah. That's what I was, you know, I'm looking to see, this is the thing you're encouraging me. I'm already thinking in this direction and you're just blowing like lots of fast wind into my fall, fall dream sails, you know? It's just exercise. It's just exercise. <laughs> but the 20 because... minutes of bike does it. It really changes my brain chemistry for the, for the day. I mean, seriously, it changes your brain chemistry. It gives you all the good, happy endorphins, serotonin, like all of that cool stuff. And then you have afterburn throughout the day. It keeps you calm. It keeps you cognitively sound. It keeps you young. Like it's meditative while you're doing it. You like just, I can't talk enough about how important daily exercise is and it energizes you. It doesn't suck your energy. Well, speaking of things that suck my energy, did you like that pivot? I loved it. <laughs> Can I pivot? Are we good? I feel I feel very encouraged. By yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, start start where you are. That's you know, don't feel overwhelmed. Yeah, for sure. Okay, I I have this on here. I don't know how much you have to say about this topic, but when we met at TMEA this past February, you let me talk your ear off about Activity Pub and Mastodon for a very, very long number of consecutive minutes in a Starbucks. And thank you for that. You're welcome. I'm at a point now where I feel like social media is dead. But then like a few weeks ago, Facebook just released threads, the most fast adopted, and I think quickly like downloaded app of all time. So it's like their Twitter competitor, 10, I think over 10 million user accounts in the first week. What is your, what is your take on this? You're a very, you're very present on social media. Like I, you're someone who like you give people like a window into yourself. And I feel like other than just like posting like my episodes of this and recently, like I'm kind of like doing, being less personal on social media and distancing myself from it over the past few years. But I'm starting to wonder like, is there benefit to me? Like maybe in a more careful or mindful way, starting to have more of an internet narrative that I am putting forth into the world. And this, of course, is a broader question, but I think of it in relationship to this new social network because Twitter has been like professionally for me, like a social network that actually has like influenced the course of my career and has like introduced me to people I would have never met otherwise. So like, I'm th I think importantly about a lot of these tools, but I'm also like trying to create a healthy relationship with it all. Where are you at with that? So let's talk about some of the things that you said. Number one, tools. Number two, like, how do you use it? What do you get out of it? And, and then what does it allow you to give to others? Like, if you don't understand, first of all, like dopamine is a thing, 
dopamine addiction is a thing. So I think if we come into it with our eyes wide open, that they are designed to trigger our dopamine receptors, which is like can drive an addiction. In other words, it makes us feel like a a little bit of a high. And you notice that when you turn off the app and you're like, whoa, I think I was like a little high. Anyway, so like acknowledge that they are intended to be addictive and trigger our dopamine receptors. And just as like my little break from coffee right now, it's important to take little breaks from the dopamine so that you can recover and then come back to it. So I actually took a break from all social media for like the month of May. I just put up a post like, hey, I'm going to be off social media for the month of May. It allowed me to recuperate my and, and reset my dopamine. Okay. So then my question for you is, what do you get out of social media? And what do you give to others yeah. through it? What I give is interesting. That's the harder question to answer. Because there's a part of me that thinks that I actually could spin a social media relationship where it is entirely self-centered and and what i mean by this is like like i use it because there there are things that i think that i am not putting out there that are worth putting out there i'm just not 100 percent sure, sure what they are and and i don't i know that i don't want to be putting out there just like everything that seems like entirely too much and has problems so i guess i just it's that you know, I could, I could just go in there and log on and promote my thing or throw up a photo and then like log off and then like ideally not interact with any of the comments. <laughs> but th- this is one of the things I'm trying to avoid. But it, it is that like, what do people get from it? And I think because I am a different human being inside of everyone's brain who's ever met me, like I don't entirely know what I'm giving when I'm putting something out there. And should it even be my concern if like, because I've, I've like done things where I'm like, I think I'm helping the community by sharing this thing and i've been like spoken to meanly on the internet for like ways i was trying to genuinely help and like the worst assumptions were made about like the simplest of things that i said so like that's an overwhelming stressor that is like that's just just not worth it for me like i don't want to be dealing with that but you know there are, it's also a disservice to not give especially if there are things that are easy to give by like tapping my thumb on a piece of glass a couple of strokes Right. So I see social media as you just did as a, as a tool. Right. And I think we forget like algorithms and everything aside, we control what comes across our screen. So if it's something we don't like, we can actually tell it like, nope, not into that. Right. And if it's something we like, we interact with it. Like that's what it's designed to do is it's, it's not. And I don't think anybody created now I'm not well-versed in every single social media. So this is not a blanket statement, but most of the social media like companies aren't there to, I mean, maybe harvest your data, right? But, but it's not intended to be detrimental to you. Nobody wants to hurt their users because then those users never come back. I, I, yes, but it's the, it's not because they want to not hurt the users. It's because they want them to come back. It's like, you know, they want all of the attention from you that they can get. And this is the thing where I, I, feel like the training of the algorithm is superficially there are tools to do it but the thing is training itself on the worst of my impulses with the device in my hand not the best and so like it's always because they know that like i'm gonna linger on some like news article that makes me feel terrible but like in a doom scrolly way like they're gonna see see, if yeah i mean if you're into doom scrolling it's gonna show you things that so So I've really been like a lot of things in my life intentional about this. And so I, on Instagram, I follow only the hashtags that I want to. And if it's something I don't like, I tell it I don't like it, right? That's because I'm very intentional about the stuff that I take in. Oh my gosh, the day that I stopped following the news was like amazing. I'm with you there. And there, you're, you're definitely like the more steps, because the, the more steps you make it easier to do good things, coming back to our bike ride conversation, like the, you know, the easier it will be to do, but the more steps you make it difficult to do things that you maybe don't want to do in your life, you'll make it harder to do. It works positively, but like in a reverse kind of way, I guess my, the way that I'm cynical about some of the more like mainstream social networks is like, like if I go on like Twitter or something, and I like put a, like a mute filter in it. Actually, you can't even trust that Twitter will work correctly anymore these days. But, but my point is like, if I mute a word, then like chances are it's like never going to show me that. But like the Facebook, Instagram, like their algorithm is pretty much like everything you just said that you do and take agency on 
it will like listen to you, but then it just retrains it based on your habits. And so, and it's always like, I'm fighting the thing. If I didn't feel like I was, if I could just check a box and say, behave this way and it would respect me, it would be cool. But the, the truth is, is like human, you know, my mind is of course going to start to linger on certain things. And then it's going to give me like a little echo chamber and say like the things you've been lingering on, we give you more of. So of course, then I see more of that. Like, I mean, there will, there will be months on Facebook where like actual friends that I like know in real life, like they'll post some cool picture of their kid doing something awesome. And I'll like, I won't see it, but I'll see like, you know, quite a lot of ads. So I don't know. I'm it's so, hard, hard to not get sucked in, you know? So first of all, like we need to acknowledge, I'm going back to our own sovereignty in our lives. I think too often we just accept that the things that we're shown, we just are expected to accept them. Like the, the ways that the world interacts with us is, is how the world is, but the world is entirely our own perspective and how we interact with it. So if what you're seeing on the screen is not something that you're into, then the first step is to be like, apparently I have been into this because that's, what's being shown to me. It's like the, the, quite a lot of trust in Facebook though, to, to the, be, reflect that correctly. <laughs> well, I mean, I'm speaking from my own experience here that my Facebook feed is filled up with job announcements, people getting, you know, new advancements, people graduating, people having babies, like all of these wonderful celebration -y posts. Like I get to see the best of everybody when I go on Facebook and the way that I contribute and interact with that is by celebrating with them. And so now when I see those people, IRL, I can be like, oh my gosh, congratulations on your new job, your new baby, your new relationship, your new move, whatever, because I've been so intentional about only interacting with those things. And that's not to say you can't, you know, take a social justice spin on things and definitely like acknowledge that there's some bad stuff going on in the world that you, you know, make a difference in if you are able to, like, that's fine if you're into that kind of thing, but then just acknowledge that you are in charge of yourself. What's that? Does that kind of make sense? It makes Robbie? sense, but I, I think like I know no, you're trying to you're trying to put on some somebody else the expectation that you've created for yourself in your own life. Well, okay, but you're assuming you're assuming that like the algorithm and the tools are acting like in much better faith than I feel like they are. Like they're designed to make money, right? So like do I want to be at the center of that? To some extent, you're right. Like, okay, first of all, and I and I give them as little ad tracking as possible. So like if I'm lingering on like posts that are like celebratory posts, I'm going to get more of that. Right. But like, what if yeah. I, my brain starts to like, well, first of all, I think like it's coming back. Oh, to the tool. Hey, Robbie, hang yeah. on one sec. Sure. Be right back. Okay. Hey, I was getting a little rambly, but I think I'll summarize differently. I think I'll just say that what you're describing, I think is a more like that agency is more attainable for me anyway. And, and others have you know, express, I've seen this expressed, like, if you take the apps off the phone, and use them pretty much on the computer or something very, very firmly associated with like, either work or productivity, or even like, a physical space or device or like, just in, in general, a context. Yeah, I mean, and so I'm working on this big, you know, research paper called the doctoral dissertation. And one of the rules of APA is that you can't personify like research. So you can't say the research shows that da, 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 da. like that's not acceptable because it's not the research that showed it. It was the interpretation of the researcher, right? So right. by saying, well, social media made me do this or social media makes me sad or social media, blah, blah, blah. It doesn't do that. Like you, you have the agency to control how you, what you take in, what you perceive. And if you're finding that it's creating a negative, you know, impact in your life, it's not empowering you to make change in the ways that you want to either for yourself or your community or your society or whatever, then why are you doing it? That's coming back to my core question, right? Is so I do, cause I do believe that like, as a, you know, it's a nerd belief of mine that software does have an opinion, like it is designed to be used and experienced in a way but like at the end of the day, yes, like if you, you know, as a person don't feel like it's benefiting you or if you feel like 
the way you that you're going to get something from it you're always fighting against the way it's like designed to be used in order you know at like and, and the result of that is that you're just feeling more stressed or more anxiety then my answer is just then don't use it yeah i mean there's an abundance of technological tools out there why are you forcing something you know a, a square peg into a round hole if it's not solving a problem for you if it's not intuitive if it's not enhancing your life if it's not helping you reach your goals if it's not helping you improve the lives of others around you then nobody says you have to be doing it nobody says you have to be you know partaking of that so i've never really been active on twitter I've never like I've downloaded threads and I've been looking at it because I like to have an awareness of all of these, you know, socially kind of things. But for me, it's not going to be a particularly useful tool until I'm ready to build another online empire of something, which I'm not going to talk about right now. Uh, you, you mentioned your research. I yeah. Were you in the middle of that thought? I'll let you finish if you were. But I... No, just that, you know, that that you shouldn't personify or, or, you know, give an inanimate object or thing sovereignty over your existence. That's all. But yeah. I could talk about my research if you want. We can be brief. Yeah, sure. I would love that. Normally when people ask me uh, about my research, you know, they, because I'm a musician, because I'm a music educator, they assume I'm getting like a DMA. I'm not. I'm getting a doctorate of education in instructional design. And I'm so into it. Like I freaking love in instructional design. I've been so fortunate that in my my current role at Con Selmer that I've been able to create educational content for music. And in that role, I've gotten to help design the instructional experiences. It's been so rewarding, so super cool. So that being said, this is an applied degree, not just a research degree. So a PhD or a DMA, you can, you know, research gray literature, research, you know, something, and then write up a paper about it. And you're contributing to the research on that topic. Very important, right? Yeah. Mine is an applied degree, which means that it's intended for my research to solve an educational problem. So I've researched an educational problem, what I believe to be an educational problem. And then I will do the a study on humans and collect information from those humans and then create what I hope to be a solution for that educational problem. Do you see how that's different from like a DMA or a PhD? Yeah. So it's taking me a little longer than some of my friends. And that is really hard for me, <laughs> but- it's going to be fantastic. So the educational problem that I'm addressing is that over the last several years, we've seen incredible social change, technological change, technological adoption in the music education classroom. We've known since like the mid 1970s that the way that we're training music educators is not exactly linked to what the job actually entails. It's even shown in much of the literature. I have like a 70 page literature review where it, you know, we, I've researched all within like papers from the last like five years. I have a couple things that are older, but essentially that what colleges are requiring for a individual to graduate and be a certified music educator is like vastly misaligned with what they're actually going to have happen to them in the classroom, which is creating issues of burnout, praxis shock, you know, stuff like that. And there's not a lot of ways that we are uh, helping sort of bridge those knowledge gaps. And then in addition to that, we look at the way that information and communication technology has been adapted into the classroom, the types of tools that are are necessary to create the types of learning experiences and the, the way that we've changed instructional strategies in the music classroom. I've narrowed my audience down to secondary instrumental, although I hope that this research design will be able to be easily replicated through elementary music, through choral music, through even post-secondary music. And then anyway, so I'm doing a case study where we're going to actually look at what is happening in the classroom. What are the competencies required 
for a teacher to be successful? What are the instructional strategies and learning activities that are aligned with 21st century education? So instead of being like, well, we think you need to, you know, only be able to rehearse your band really well. Well, you also need to be able to have these information and communication technology tools and understandings. You should be able to adapt your learning for synchronous and asynchronous online delivery. True. Yeah. Are you finding that, you know, a lot of teachers who are teaching online? Like, oh, people were on, teaching online okay, before the pandemic. <laughs> like, sure. I guess I, I just mean, don't, it's not, yeah. it's, it's like, seems, I know so few people who, who did it before and who still do it now that I guess it's like, I feel like that was not a core thing I was missing from my university experience, but I, maybe I'm just like not awake to how much of this is happening. Well, and let's understand you mean, that. But, that like now, now that we've done it, now that we've had a mass shutdown, no one says that it can't happen again, you know? So, so us being able to quickly adapt and adopt new instructional strategies and learning activities that can be delivered through remote means is an essential tool. And then looking at not just what did the pandemic do and force us into and change the way that we perceive music education, but then what about all the social unrest that we've been going through? So there's a whole section on that and looking at everything from DEI and social emotional learning and you know, relevancy based voice and choice, all of that is in the literature review. So ideally the work product that I'll come out with is a competency guide. Okay. So saying I've, I've researched what's actually happening in the classroom. I've talked to all these teachers. I've validated this. I've ranked it. I've used multiple qualitative research tools. And here is what I think is necessary for music educators to be competent to enter the music classroom and be successful in the 21st century. Ta-da! I love that. It's like, because I don't really know, like, what that is necessarily. Like, I mean, I mean, certainly, like, we, you know, have this kind of, or at least similar kinds of conversations and research are happening, like, in the field of music education. Like, do you, I mean, are you finding that there are existing frameworks for understanding those competencies that, whether they're, like, you know, you feel like they're, the right ones are relevant today, yeah. you know, I guess that's a side, but like, so no, that's one of the, one of my issues with existing research is that they usually start with an existing framework, right? So they're like, well, here are the list of competencies. And so now we're going to have the, the participants in this study rank them on a Likert scale. And so we're going to see which competencies are most important, but we haven't just thrown those competencies out and said, no we're not looking at an existing framework. We're looking at an existing phenomenon. We're looking at the existing actual factual details of what are happening. Because how do you how do you find new competencies if you're only ever looking and ranking old ones? And that's what I want. I want to find what are the new things that are happening in the classroom that align to a competency that we should have because it's already happening. Does that this make is, sense? Yeah, it makes total sense. In fact, it's like hearing you describe it, it sounds like what you write on this subject would actually maybe be like readable to a teacher. Oh, absolutely. Like, I'm going to, I mean, I'm going to publish this study. And then my, what I really truly hope happens is that by publishing this, you know, competency guide that I, I don't anticipate that universities are going to be able to look at it. Certainly they can. Will they be able to adopt and change their, you know, teacher training methods and programs to align with the existing competencies? Maybe not. Maybe they'll do further research on it. And, and 20 years from now, we'll see some actual change in, in how we train music educators. What I'm hoping for is that some innovative programs embrace it and that professional development organizations and, you know, teacher teacher training within, you know, the in-service training opportunities that we have, look at this competency guide and go, you know, we're pretty good at these ones, but we're missing these ones. And so these are opportunities for us to create professional learning experiences that help close those knowledge gaps. Yeah. I'm really curious to see where the, where this leads you and to read. I need to. Yeah. I mean, if you're, if you're listening to this and you're a secondary instrumental educator and you want to be a participant in my study, could you just email me at elisa at elisajansen.com? Yeah, totally. And I'll put that in the show notes as well. Should I be involved in your study to this capacity? What, what are, what exactly, like, what kind of data are you taking from teachers? Is it just like 
the the questioning or are you like doing any observ observations or like interview? Oh, so it's going to be a triangulated case study, which means that there will be three data collection opportunities for me. One is going to be an online questionnaire that includes some light demographic information. Of course, everything can be completely anonymous, but we, we want to be able to associate like and make sure that you're, you're fitting the you know, study inclusion criteria. Okay. And then we, I will use a Likert scale as part of it, exploring existing competencies, instructional strategies, and learning activities that are from the existing literature. And then the third part is open-ended questions. And that's where we hope to discover the additional competencies that are not in the existing literature. So that's phase one. Phase two is interviews. So I'm hoping to have some one-on-one -on -one interviews with with people just exploring, like, what do you do in your day? What are the instructional strategies that you're using? What, how are you doing? Like, is it true that you're just rehearsing music to perform at the next concert? And then when that concert's over, you hand out new music and then we're rehearsing music until we perform at the next concert. And then after that, you hand out, then you get the idea. Okay. Yep. Or are there things that you're actually doing with the understanding that, you know, maybe that's my job right now, because that's, what the school expects of me is rehearsal performance, rehearsal performance. But as a properly qualified, certified music educator, I should be able to then pivot and take a job in the next district over teaching music technology and piano, right? Yeah, like and what underlying set of skills do you feel like should empower you to do that? That are like the, well, I guess this is what you're looking to discover. I guess yeah, like, I mean, what, that are the... missing from the current curriculum, you know, in, in higher ed anyway. Right. I mean, we're really thorough on, on our music competencies. Like right. we're, we're all really, really good musicians, you guys, but we're missing some of the teaching competencies and we aren't spending enough time on personal and, and professional competencies. Right. So those are things that a lot of other literature has already covered. And as an instructional designer, I of course want to focus on like Yes, those are those are those competencies, the ones that we know of. I want to know what else. What else? Where are those other gaps? So anyway, so interview is this is phase two. Those interviewees will also participate in the questionnaire, but we'll be looking at the questionnaire and being like, okay, so what else? What else is there? And that will allow me to sort of lead the conversation and and go deeper into discovery in a way that somebody who's just typing into a, a screen may not be able to get at. And then phase three is a focus group. And I'm not just looking at like music educators. I'm also including fine arts administrators. So the people who are externally, the ones who are coming up with the job descriptions, the ones who are hiring music educators, because it's one thing to be like, here's what I need to do in my classroom every day. And another thing for the fine arts administrator to be like, here are the things that we think they should be doing in their classroom every day. So getting those multiple perspectives and the focus group will bring together those two participant types and reviewing what the outcome was of phase one and phase two, right? So I'll have a draft competency guide and then we'll be looking at that and being like, okay, is this accurate? Help me rank them. What is most important here? And maybe it will turn out that they're like, no, the personal competencies, like being able to time manage, being able to, you know, do personal care, being able to, you know, collaborate with others. Like those are what I would consider personal skills. Maybe those are actually more important than the music skills. I would argue that they are, but I would also wonder like, how, how do you prepare a pre-service teacher for those things without just giving them more classroom experience. Oh, well, but here's the thing. Why do we need classroom experience when we have simulations? I'm just saying, no, you know, that's like, this is one of my, my pet peeves. Let me get up on my soapbox here and sure. say that, you know, we keep saying we need more field service. We need more, more time actually in the classroom. No, we need more. That's like saying, a plastic surgeon needs to be cutting people open more and doing surgery more for them to understand. There's lots of other ways to learn than by practical experience, right? Like we can read about it. We can watch about it. We can make decisions about it. We can create it. We can simulate it. And so those are the, the newer modern opportunities that we in the instructional design field apply in corporate training for heaven's sake. You know, 
why can't we use them in music education? I'm not discounting the importance of field service. I absolutely 1000% am behind it, but nobody says that we can't run simulation after simulation and, and use machine learning to, you know, help prepare music educators more effectively for the actual things that are going to happen or may happen to them. Tell me more about these child classroom simulators that I'm <laughs> missing out on. <laughs> I mean, there's so many, there's so many ways to do it. You know, everything from here's a scenario, A, B, or C, what do you choose? Right. You know, like a practical example that actually happened to me, 51 fifth graders, dress rehearsal for a performance, everybody's standing on risers. One of the girls didn't have breakfast and locked her knees, passed out on the floor off the top riser, right? That's, that's the scenario, A, B, or C, what do you do? Yeah. Right. Do you have, do you run to the office and get help? Do you use the phone and call for help? Do you, what do you have your students do? How do you occupy the other 50 students who are in the room? You are the only adult, you know, like you can, you can present actual scenarios that happen and give them options, let them think through it. And then when they choose their scenario, they're presented with the natural consequence of their choice. And using like machine learning, we can actually like help them see what their options are so that if that actually happens or something similar to that happens, it's not like, oh crap, did we talk about this in my rehearsal methods class? It's like, oh, I remember this from a scenario. It's very similar to blah, blah, blah. I know what to do here. Yeah. I mean, some things it helps to have thought about before they happen, but will like likely never happen. But in that chance that they do, it's going to be bad. And you, I mean, but some things are going to happen to all of us. So why not just be prepared for a medical emergency in your classroom? I feel like that should be something that we cover. <laughs> right. Well, we do. I mean, every time I do a CPR training, I'm like, huh, okay, this doesn't make me feel like I could do this tomorrow, but it probably does to some extent qualify me better than zero to have been like watching these videos and answering these questions. Um, All right. So the goals of the research, better, better teacher training, less practice, praxis shock, more teachers staying contentedly in the classroom is like, I feel like that's my mission because if we keep teachers in the classroom, then we keep students learning music and we benefit the world at large. So anyway, we've been talking like forever. <laughs> Understood. You know, we said we would keep this tight. Well, you and I could talk all day long. I think I, that's, I, I would clear. contentedly spend like 12 hours hanging out. I like with how you, you really so. thought about that number. Like, <laughs> well, I started with like three and then it went to six and I'm like, now nah, all day. It is all day. Yeah. We d we have before, you know, I enjoyed our Apple store excursion at TMEA earlier this year. Yeah, that was fun. It's great. So, so speaking of things, you know, tools to use in the classroom. So I've already alluded to my job at Con Selmer, working with artists and instructors to create digital education materials. They're all hosted on a website called musicprofessor.com. And being able to use digital tools in the classroom, I'm hoping that that shows up in my research is like, oh, yes, being able to, you know, utilize external tools to support my students learning is an essential competency. Ta -da. You're helping me segue. Do you have time to do like a super fast music tech and app tip? Or was that like your subtle cue of saying like you got a jet? Oh, no, I can do a music tip, a music tech tip of the week, tech tip of the week. Yeah. Usually me and every guest will pick one. We don't, we can elaborate on it to the extent that you like and go in the order that you like. Tech tip, like how to use technology better. Yeah. Like I'll get, so I'll give an example of mine and I know I've done this one on the show before, but I think it's worth repeating. Cause it's one of those things that when, when I say it in a session that I'm presenting, like all the eyes go wide. So if you're using a Mac, you can, in fact, I think this is a now by default on, but if not, you can go into the system settings go under the accessibility area. There's an area called Zoom. And if you click it, then there's a little toggle you can turn on, which will allow you to hold down a modifier key of your choice. I choose control. And then when you like do the motion on your mouse or on your trackpad of like scrolling while holding that modifier key, it'll just like zoom in really close to wherever the cursor is on your computer screen. 
So like super useful for me teaching oftentimes technology to my general music students. And I need to like show a button I'm clicking, but the button is super small in the user interface. I hold down the control key. I do the gesture of like scrolling up and then it just like zooms straight into that. It just makes that little bit of the computer screen, those pixels, like the whole entire screen for the students. And then scroll away. It's also helpful for me for making videos that demonstrate software and all sorts of other things. So that would be like a tech tip. Yeah, no. Yeah, yeah, that's super rad. So I have like two. So one is just start using chat GPT or whatever generative AI of your choices, just like start and, and see what it can do for you. I found it to be very helpful in everything for like condensing artist bios from 17 million words down to like 170, but I've used it for so many other things, removing HTML or adding HTML or creating iframes. Or like, I think that the, the, the sooner you just embrace it and be like, this is a potential tool for me, the better you're going to get at using it. I, that's one that remember how I said, like, if it's not a problem, why are you trying to fix it? Like, but I do think that being able to use or at least have a fundamental knowledge of what's happening in AI right now is going to serve all music educators well. And then my favorite tool, I already alluded to it because it's on my 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 desktop, is Snagit. And a lot of people are like, oh, but you can do, you know, screenshots and other things. But this is like supercharging your screenshots by automatically opening it into a editor where you can blur, you can delete, you can add text, you can add arrows, you can, you know, just screenshot individual parts of a, a screen. You can like, it's just a teaching tool that I use everything from teaching people that they wrote something wrong on a spreadsheet to like instruction on how to navigate musicprofessor.com. That's awesome. Yeah. I think having a screen screenshot manager of some sort is like a really powerful tool. And they usually do just add a couple of really nice things that the operating system doesn't have, but they're so nice. Like I use one called clean shot and mm -hmm. it's like almost the same as the way that the Mac, but it's just like the little screenshot. Once you take it floats in the lower left corner, and then you can like just copy it to your clipboard and then delete it in one click, or you can click a, a button to make it just sort of float permanently on you you know, in a window, or you can even click an edit button and like get a tool for blurring out stuff, adding call outs, circles and stuff. Oh yeah. Uh, it's really yeah, kind of nice. I, I use it seriously like every day. So yeah. I guess that was my app pick of the week. Kind of, um, but it was also a tech tip of yeah. sorts. Well, thank you. Thank you for doing this. It's been a pleasure. I know that we could go on for another hour. I unfortunately do have to do my normal day job stuff. So. I appreciate you taking this much time. It's so great to talk to you. Yeah, likewise. Let's talk again soon. I'm Robbie Burns. Thanks for listening to Music Ed Tech Talk. You can find the show's page, show notes for this episode, and my blog at musicedtechtalk.com. You can subscribe to blog posts through an RSS app of your choice, and you can subscribe to the podcast in a podcast app of your choice. You can now get blog posts delivered right into your email inbox once a week. Please rate and review this show in the podcast app. It absolutely helps. Word of mouth is helpful too, so please spread the word about it. You can learn more about my music and teaching career at RobbieBurns.com. I'm all over the internet at Robbie Burns or underscore Robbie Burns on most social media sites. On Mastodon, I'm Robbie at social.musicedtechtalk.com. Consider supporting me on Patreon at patreon.com slash musicedtechtalk. All tiers get perks, but even the base tier gets you access to the Music Ed Tech Talk Discord community, where you can chat with other supporters and guests of the show about music, apps, pedagogy, lesson ideas, tech support, and more. It's a fun place to be, and I hope to connect with you there. Thanks to this episode's sponsor, Scale Exercise Play Along Tracks. Be sure to check it out. See you next time.